Chapter 10 Where Were We? Friday Afternoon Max walks out of the bathroom and puts his hand on his belt. Now where were we? Max stops. His expression changes to one of subtle surprise as he looks closer at Melissa, whose eyes are wide and lifeless. Shit. Max puts his hand on her neck, feeling for a pulse. She must have gone in a shock and died. Max slowly turns to Alex and flashes his evil grin. She's still warm, though. Max smiles as he begins unfastening his belt, but stops when he hears a thud coming from the hallway. He looks at the hallway and then to Alex. What the hell was that? I don't know. Is there somebody else in this house? No! Max thinks for a moment. I'm gonna go look. And if I find someone else in this house, I'm gonna gut them like a fish. He moves his face closer to Alex and roughly grabs him by the throat. And then I'm gonna come back here and decorate this room with your intestines. Max gives Alex one last glare before he exits the bedroom and walks into the hallway. He stops and listens. He hears another bumping sound ahead of him. It appears to be coming from the closet in the hall. He stands outside the closet, slowly turns the knob, and opens the door. A dead body falls out of the closet onto the floor in front of Max. The body is that of a thin, balding man in his late forties. Dried blood stains his face. Max is surprised and confused. What the hell? Max's expression changes to one of extreme pain. His body twists slightly. He winces as he turns his head to see where the source of pain is coming from. Alex's face comes into view, holding an expression of rage. He makes a stabbing motion with his arm, causing a more extreme grimace from Max, who then slumps forward. Max coughs, spitting up blood as his body weakens and falls forward, leaving an image of Alex standing with a snarled expression of satisfaction, chef's knife in hand, dripping with blood. Flashback, Wednesday, early morning. John Bromley, the man we knew as Alex, stands in a back alley. He is wearing a patient's uniform with the words Madisonville Psychiatric Hospital, patient 111737, stenciled on the left breast. John looks around. There is a construction site nearby. He studies a tool bag housing a hammer and some pliers, among other things. He cautiously picks up the bag and brings it with him as he peers around the corner. John sees a man in his fifties walking down the street. He is on a cell phone. More importantly, he appears to be roughly the same size as John. He is wearing a white dress shirt halfway unbuttoned. His necktie is untied and he is carrying a briefcase with a sports jacket draped over it. He is agitated. John ducks into a small alleyway as he eyes the man who is speaking into a cell phone. You just bite your tongue and listen to me. I'll be home when I'm home. I'm the head of this family. John listens to the man and presses his head against the brick alley wall. He imagines the many times his father said those very words to him. He winces as the agitated man continues to bark into the phone. I'm giving the orders here! John grits his teeth. Those were the last words John's father said to him before John buried a hatchet into his skull. Just make sure dinner is on the table when I walk through that door, or you can find yourself a new husband. The agitated man turns his cell phone off and mutters under his breath as he walks down the alley. As he reaches the corner of the small side alley, John Bromley reaches out, grabs him by the shirt, and wheels him around, pinning him against the building wall. Help! Help! Somebody help me! Bromley throws the man to the ground. Shut up! You shut up! The man continues to scream as Bromley reaches into the tool bag and pulls out a pair of pliers. As the man continues to plead for help, Bromley shoves the pliers into the man's mouth, grabs hold of his tongue, and rips it out. The man gurgles as his mouth spews blood. Bromley grabs a hammer out of the bag, lifts it up into the air, and brings it down with force. Flashback, Wednesday, late morning. 
A thin, balding man named Alex sits in the kitchen of the large, white Victorian house. His leg is propped up on the kitchen table. He is holding up a copy of Bra Busters and masturbating vigorously. His leg convulses and bumps a coffee cup, knocking it off of the table and sending it shattering to the floor. Damn it! Alex, the dead man who fell out of the closet, stands, wipes his hand off onto his shirt, and bends down. He begins picking up the pieces of the cup when something catches his eye. He looks at the front door of the house. Through the window, he can see a man walking around on his front porch. The man is wearing a dress shirt with a sports jacket. Alex wasn't expecting any company and doesn't recognize the man. He gets up, fastens his pants, and makes his way for the door. When Alex opens the door and steps out onto the porch, John Bromley stands, staring at him. Uh, what can I do for you? John Bromley smiles. What's your name, sir? Uh, uh Alex? Uh, how long have you lived here? Uh, about ten years or so. Well, that's a long time to live in one place, don't you agree? Not really. The house I lived in before this was my home for over twenty years. And what caused you to leave there? A job. And do you live here with your family? Uh, no, I'm, I'm divorced. John shakes his head and lets out a disgusted sigh. I don't believe in divorce myself. Once you're married, there is no way out. Other than death, of course. Ah, yes, family. That's what it's all about. Alex seems confused. Okay, um, who are you and what do you want? You'll have to forgive me. You see, I used to live here when I was younger. It's my home. It will always be my home. He runs his hand over a flowered pillow sitting on a wicker chair. I must say, I do admire the decor. I expect the inside is just as nice. Alex shrugs. I like to think so. Did you decorate it yourself? Oh, no, no, no. My ex-wife did all this before she left. I decided to keep it, though. The women really love it. In fact, I've come to think of this place as my own private beaver trap. Alex lets out a chuckle. John is not amused. Um, <laughs> so you said you used to live here? John Bromley nods. Yes. Home sweet home. That's interesting, because I'm a historian. I, I have a record of all the families who lived here before me. Did you know the Bromleys used to live in this house? The Bromleys? You know John Bromley. The name sounds familiar. John Bromley, the serial killer. He used to live here with his parents and three sisters. He killed his parents and his siblings with an axe. Apparently he wasn't too thrilled with his father's decision to move the family. John begins to grind his teeth. He then eluded authorities and eventually got married, if you can believe that. Even wound up having a daughter. From all accounts, he was a textbook husband and father before he decided to chop them up too. Apparently they weren't the perfect family he had hoped for. John tries to fight back the memories of the axe sticking out of his wife's head and how it took three solid hacks into his daughter's chest before she finally stopped screaming. He takes a breath and quickly collects himself. The past never did interest me much. I'm more of a future man myself. You can't live in the past, you know. Well, oh, I don't live in the past. I just find it interesting. I don't. It's all about the future. And right now. You know, other than myself and the Bromleys, only three other families ever lived here. And judging by your age, I can't see that you fit the description of any of them. Is that so? What's your last name? Bromley. Alex laughs. <laughs> That's a good one. John Bromley is not laughing, and Alex notices this. <laughs> well, Bromley? Um, are, are you related to John Bromley? John Bromley pauses in deep thought. I'm pausing because I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Um... Why is that? Because I am John Bromley. Alex starts to chuckle a bit, followed by John doing the same. Suddenly, John's face goes straight, emotionless. Alex stops laughing. 
he finally realizes he is indeed standing face to face with the serial killer, John Bromley. Alex turns and runs back into the house. He tries to shut the door behind him, but John kicks it back open before it can latch. John grabs a nearby shovel sitting on the porch and follows Alex up the stairs. Alex's screams of death can be heard as a notification rings on a laptop computer sitting on the kitchen counter. The house goes silent. A blood-covered John Bromley walks to the laptop, curious about the notification ring. He leans in and looks closely at the website. It's an internet dating site. In bold letters it reads, Hello, Alex. You are logged in. Meet the woman of your dreams now. John Bromley smiles. Flashback, Friday, afternoon. Melissa whimpers as Max pulls off his outer shirt, revealing a tan t-shirt, and begins to undo his belt, but freezes when he hears a cellular phone ringing in the attached bathroom. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Max enters the bathroom and shuts the door. John Bromley works his hands from the duct tape. He quickly leans over to Melissa. I'm loose. Are you, are you going to be okay? Can you move? Melissa is shocked and relieved. You're, you're loose. Oh, get me out of here. Hurry. He begins to untie her hands, but stops occasionally as he talks to her. I've really enjoyed getting to know you, Melissa. Do you feel the same? Uh, hurry, Alex. He'll be out soon. I've felt an instant connection with you. I think we share the same morals and values. I, I think together we can create the perfect family. What? Uh, just hurry. Untie me. Do you feel the same? Do you want the perfect family? We can do it. We can create the perfect family together as man and wife. Melissa is confused. Will you marry me, Melissa? What? A Alex, untie me? Get me out of here. Will you marry me? Will you? What are you talking about? This is your last chance, Melissa. I can't let anyone else have you. Please, just get me out of here. John Bromley picks up a pillow and guides it slowly toward her face. I'm sorry it has to be this way, Melissa. It could have been perfect. No, no! She screams, but it is quickly muffled due to John Bromley forcing the pillow down onto her face with aggression. His face curls into a scowl as he smothers the life out of Melissa. Chapter 11 Bodies Friday Afternoon Dr. Clark is pale. His lifeless eyes stare up at nothing. Dr. Grimm dusts the room with a feather duster. He stops, takes a breath, and glances back at Dr. Clark's dead body. He begins to pace back and forth. Oh boy. He runs his fingers through his thinning hair and begins to dust again, more energetically. Just clean, clean, everything will be just fine if I clean. He stops and looks back at Dr. Clark again. All right, uh, okay, uh. I gotta get organized. Um, um, okay. He bends down and straightens up Dr. Clark's crumpled jacket. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? He starts to pace and jumps when he hears a knock at the door. Dr. Grimm snaps his head around toward the sound, his eyes bulging with fear. There's another knock. Dr. Grimm looks around panicked. He freezes and physically makes himself smaller in his attempt to be quiet. Franklin, I know you're in there. I just heard your voice a second ago. It's Dr. Lewis. Dr. Grimm clenches his fist and whispers, Shit! She knocks again. Franklin, open the door. Uh, uh, just a minute. He looks around frantically, trying to think of a way out of this. The knocking continues. Franklin, what are you doing? There is a small throw blanket on the back of a chair. Dr. Grimm moves quickly to grab it, and in the process, knocks a pencil holder off his desk, which makes a loud bang. Damn it! Dr. Grimm grabs the pencil holder and places it back on the table in an attempt to make it nice and neat. He then takes the blanket and tries to cover Dr. Clark's body as best as he can. Franklin, let me in and we can... comfort each other. She waits a moment and knocks again. Franklin! Dr. Grimm opens the door and launches himself out of the office, swiftly shutting the door behind him. 
He tries to play it calm, but is not successful. His speech is rushed and panicked. Oh, oh, hi, Kate. How are you? Dr. Lewis looks suspiciously at Dr. Grimm. What's going on? You're acting strange. Uh, n nothing, nothing, nothing's, nothing's going on, nothing at all. Uh, everything's fine. Uh, uh, why do you ask? Do you have a girl in there? Dr. Grimm is genuinely surprised by the accusation. No! It's that bimbo from accounting, isn't it? What? It's that bleach blonde from accounting. Who? Miss Silicon Valley, I've seen you checking out her fake boobs. Dr. Lewis, there's nobody here. Uh, nobody, just, just me. He puts his arm around Dr. Lewis and rushes her to the office door, speaking frantically as they move. Let's go somewhere. Oh, let's get some coffee, okay? Dr. Lewis stops when she notices that Dr. Grimm isn't wearing his tie. This is very unusual for him. Where's your tie? Dr. Grimm fumbles around trying to think of a reasonable answer. Uh, uh, uh... I'm just not wearing it. Come on, let's go. Dr. Lewis pulls away from him. Franklin, you're acting strange. She rushes to Dr. Grimm's office door. Kate, no, no. She bursts into the office before Dr. Grimm can stop her. She puts her hand over her mouth. Oh my, is, is that? Dr. Grimm stands in the doorway. He's now calm. It's Dr. Clark. Is he? Dead? He fell. He fell and hit his head. I did everything I could for him, but he didn't make it. As Dr. Lewis runs to the body and uncovers Dr. Clark, Dr. Grimm steps into the room, shuts the door, and locks it. Well, get a card in here! Dr. Lewis begins to check Dr. Clark out, specifically looking at his head area. Dr. Grimm looms in the corner of the room behind her. He reaches into a box and pulls out a large syringe. Dr. Lewis continues to look around at Dr. Clark's head. She appears puzzled. I don't see any signs of head trauma. Dr. Lewis then takes her attention off of Dr. Clark's head as she notices the red abrasions on Dr. Clark's throat. Dr. Lewis touches the abrasions and a peculiar look comes over her face as it begins to dawn on her that Dr. Clark has been strangled. Dr. Grimm, now directly behind Dr. Lewis, grabs her head and holds it against his body as he slams the air-filled syringe into Dr. Lewis's ear. Her eyes widen as he pushes the plunger down. She begins to convulse violently before finally becoming still and slumping. Dr. Grimm lets her body go, and she falls on top of the deceased Dr. Clark. Dr. Grimm rushes to a nearby plant and stuffs the syringe in it. He grabs his hair with both hands. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? He looks at Dr. Lewis's body and gasps. Oh, no. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? He falls heavily into his chair as he contemplates his next move. He is panicked and frantic and freezes when he sees the phone. I'm going to call Ski Mask. He grabs the phone, dials, and waits impatiently as it rings. Come on, answer! Answer! Melissa whimpers as Ski Mask, the man we previously knew as Max, pulls off his outer shirt revealing a tan t-shirt and begins to undo his belt, but freezes when he hears a cellular phone ringing in the attached bathroom. He refastens his belt and walks to the bathroom door. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Ski Mask enters the bathroom and shuts the door. He eyes the ringing cellular phone and picks it up. Hello? Ski Mask! Oh, thank God I finally got a hold of you! What do you want? I'm busy. Did you find Bromley? Yeah. Dr. Grimm is shocked and excited. You did? You did? You were... Really? Is he there? What's happening? Did you catch him? Will you settle down? Well, is he secured? Yes! Dr. Grimm is elated. Finally, something goes right today. He takes a breath and calms himself. Did you have any problems? Piece of cake. Where did you find him? He came back to his old house. <laughs> You're kidding. You were right. Of course I was right. I've been guarding this maniac long enough to know what makes him tick. How did you get into the house? Did you sneak in and take him by surprise? 
He invited me in. What? <laughs> How did you manage that? Haven't you been listening? I know him. I know his tendencies. All I had to do was talk about family. So I made up some bullshit about having an estranged relationship with my father, and that was pretty much it. Dr. Grimm shakes his head. He actually went back to his house. Amazing! I thought he'd be smarter than that. Smart has nothing to do with it. He's intelligent, sure, but he has a drive that he can't control. He's obsessed with things being perfect. To him, this is the perfect house. There was no way he could keep from coming back here. He wants to live in the perfect house with the perfect family. That's what drives him. It overcomes his intelligence. He is insane, after all. <sighs> I, I really thought that he would leave the area. I should put you on my medical staff ski mask. No thanks. You shrinks have your ways, I have mine. Anyway, he was no match for me. I see. Did you kill him? No, I think it's best if we just sedate him, bring him back to the institution, and I'll hang him in his room, make it look like suicide. You can come up with some creative bullshit as to why you didn't inform the media. I'm sure you'll come up with something plausible. Uh, yes, I know just how to handle it. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna have an innocent bystander casualty. Wh what Who? Just some slut. She saw me, I can't let her live. Nothing for you to worry about. Uh, I, uh, I see. Um, on a related note, um, I have something else I need you to help me with. What? Um, it's, um... Well, come on, spit it out. Uh, I have a couple of casualties here myself. What? What do you mean? Well, I, uh, <laughs> um, you know Dr. Clark and Dr. Lewis? Yeah. Um... I, uh, well, in a word, they're dead. What? What happened? Uh, it was... I... They, they knew too much. They saw too much. They just... I, Are you trying to tell me that you killed them? Well, I'd rather not put it in those terms, but I didn't know what else to do. They, they had too much information. They just... Will you settle down? I'll take care of it. All we have to do is... There is a quick, sharp scream from the other room. Ski Mask looks in the direction of the scream, wondering what that was about. Uh, Ski Mask? Ski Mask, are you there? Ski Mask's mind is still on the scream as he speaks. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, listen, get over here as soon as you can and help me with these guys first, and then we'll clean up your mess. Uh, o over there? Uh, okay. Um, sure, sure. I gotta go. Ski Mask hangs up the phone. Dr. Grimm takes a breath stands up and walks to a nearby mirror. He straightens his shirt and looks at his reflection assuredly. <sighs> you can do this. You can do this. This will all work out just fine.